discussion uh, shorter than it is already going to be, so I propose we get started. The first thing you see on the screen behind the panel is a uh, website that we've set up specifically for this uh, Tories Technology Law panel presentation. Uh, the website, which you can all go to right now, is letsdoccopyright.ca. Let's doc copyright.ca, and uh, you can actually live blog the event if you want to weigh in with your comments and uh, uh, opinions as we're going through. The panel, the Tories Technology Law panel today, consists of uh, myself as the moderator, my name is Jeremy DeBeer, I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa, and four distinguished uh, experts on the subject of copyright and documentary films. The um, uh, first panelist to my far left is Tina Hahn. She's a board member, uh, co-director, I believe, of the co-chair of the Documentary Organization of Canada. Uh, she's also the founder of Symmetry Media. That's a unique producer of programming that incorporates health and spirituality within a multicultural perspective. And she herself is a producer and director of Gemini and other award-winning films, and she's edited 40 independent productions. To my far right is David Feuer. David Feuer is the acting director of the Bushko Samuelson Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, CIPIC, which many of you are familiar with here at the University of Ottawa. He practiced technology law for uh, about a decade in British Columbia uh, and Ontario with national firms, and later with his own firm, Fewer & Company. Uh, he also clerked at the Federal Court of Canada, and his graduate studies thesis was on the application of the Charter and Rights and Freedoms to copyright law. And he's taught and written extensively uh, on intellectual property, privacy, and other technology issues. Also to my right is Professor Sean Flynn from the Washington College of Law at American University. He's the Associate Director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property there. He's been a senior attorney with the Consumer Project on Technology and has worked also for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. He has completed judicial clerkships with the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit of the United States and the South African Constitutional Court and has written extensively on rights of access to knowledge, uh, including medicines and essential goods and services. And to my left is Professor Peter Yazzi, also of American University. He is the faculty director of the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic, CIPIC's sister clinic at the Washington College of Law. His accolades and accomplishments are too numerous to mention, suffice it to say that he is a prolific writer on copyright issues, and there are few, if any, folks uh, on the planet with a better reputation or deeper expertise than Professor Yazzie. So we're very, very fortunate to have this panel of experts here to talk about uh, copyright culture and documentary films. I'm going to start off with a clip from a documentary film. This is a film produced, co-produced by a company called I Steal Film. E Y I or E Y E S T W E L film and the National Film Board of Canada. It's a film made by Brett Gaylor, and I'll let his uh, story introduce itself. Today, we're going to create a mashup, a fun and adventurous way to make something fresh out of something stable. <laughs> and we heard a uh, real talk on the aesthetic and legal margins of music. When you experiment with cut ups over a period of time, you find that some of the cut ups seem to refer to future events. <laughs> Drop the grand and then cut in a break. Now, how random is random? No question the most insidious virus in the midst of this illegal downloading of music is some people with some uh, sampler glitch poppy noise. It sounds like on your it sounds the like happy up tempo funnel poppy. Uh, Michael Jackson had the Mounties called in to confiscate all copies of the CD. Now, before we get our freak on, we need to match up our views.
The operator, on some level, knew just where he was cutting in. Tell me who is the author of this song. If you guessed the Jackson Five, you'd be wrong. Try again. <laughs> If you just guessed Queen, you're wrong again, because this music was actually created by my favorite artist, Girl Talk. Girl Talk makes matches. For him, the computer is an instrument, and what he plays are hundreds of tiny samples from the history of music that he rearranges to make new songs. Pop music and uh, music from different genres is untouchable, you know, and Johnson's untouchable. Obviously, they create them and make they force that idea in their mind. These people are super, so it's untouchable. So just being able to just manipulate and do whatever you want, you know, just kind of put Elton John in a headlock and just, you know, put a beat behind them and put a beat on his head. Whether or not you think this music is original isn't the point. Because the rules of this game don't depend on who made the song. They depend on who owns the copyright. And according to the people that do, sampling even a single note is against the law. And that means my favorite artist is a criminal. That means these kids should not be dancing. You should not be watching because I'm not allowed to use these songs in my film. That's the world we live in today. And it's where this game of remixing is the brick wall of intellectual property. And for any good remixer, that's a call to arms. <laughs> this movie is about a war. A war over ideas. The battleground is the internet. And I take that personally. Because me and the internet were born at exactly the same time. <laughs> I was born on a small island of the West Coast. I was isolated, on purpose. My parents were trying to get away from me. But like all kids, I wanted the opposite. I wanted to connect back. Luckily, the creators of the internet thought the same way. This computer would talk to this computer, sending a message first to this computer and forward it onto this computer, thereby acting as a relay. Millions of computers were connected and evolved into one perfect machine, designed for a single purpose, sharing information. So I shared. I reached beyond my island home, learned, related, reacted, shared my life with the world, and millions shared their lives with me in return. And from all this sharing, a new language emerged. We called it Remix. A media literate generation learned to download the world's culture and use it to say something different. Funny things, political things, new things were uploaded back. It didn't matter what they made. What had changed was that anyone could make it. Consumers had become creators. This is Folk Art 2.0. Okay, we're going to stop it there. The uh, Students' Federation of the University of Ottawa is going to be doing a full screening of this film, uh, of which date I'm not quite sure, but we're going to post that to the live blog at lect.copyright.ca. This um, panel presentation today is about the issues raised in the segment you just saw, but not in the way that you might think. We're not here to debate the merits or demerits of the <coughs> ideological perspective that Brett Gaylor is portraying in his film. 
I think that all of us would agree that it's important to have a debate about those issues. The problem we're going to talk about today is that for documentary filmmakers to present one or the other side of the debate over these issues, they need to use copyright protected content. They need access to copyright protected content in order to tell their story. The paradox is documentary filmmakers rely on copyright right protection when they're uh, disseminating their works. The financing deals and the dissemination models for documentary films rely on copyright protection. And it's that paradox that we're going to talk about today. So the, uh, the first question that I want to ask is, uh, is to Tina from uh, the Documentary Organization of Canada. And I would like her perspective on why documentaries are important. Why is it worth having a panel like we're having today to talk about copyright and documentaries? I think documentaries are important because in many ways they capture the real stories that we as Canadians experience and capture part of our history, capture how we feel about current events that are going on that are based on fact and are different than necessarily the portrayals that, that occur in dramatic feature films or, or other TV programming that might fall under the, the realm of factual programming, mm -hmm. which would include cooking shows and reality TV. And, and I think the reality that reality TV projects is maybe a little different than the world the documentary filmmakers project. Oh, I see. The documentary filmmakers are the real reality. We're the real reality, yes. Okay. Great, and uh, so, so Peter, what's the copyright issue? What got you interested in the area of documentary filmmaking and, and copyright? So what I, I want to sort of try to answer that question with reference to the, the work that, that, that we've been doing on this issue in the United States. And I guess the first thing I should say is who the we is. Um, the, the we is, is, is myself and my, my, my law school colleagues, my essential collaborator, Patricia Ofterheide, who wishes she were here today, and over time, because we've been at this for five years or so, an ever-increasing number of documentary filmmakers, lawyers, and others who are part of the, the snowball effect that I'm, I'm going to be describing to you. The issue is simple, and we discovered it five years ago when we did a set of structured interviews with about a hundred, um, either hundreds, hundred American, U.S. documentary filmmakers at sort of mid-career and beyond. And the issue is that the, the demands for copyright clearance, and I'll come back for a moment to the question of where those demands come from, are, or in, at least in the United States, or were deforming the process of documentary film production. It wasn't just that people had to pay more money than they would have liked to pay. It was that they were foregoing entire projects or revising continuing projects because they couldn't clear the rights to the third-party copyrighted material that they felt was essential to tell the story of reality that it is the business of documentaries to tell. And so once we were faced with these results, and they were very dramatic, very powerful, and very unexpected, frankly, to us. We had not expected the problem to be as, as severe as these interviews revealed it to be. The question arose, what to do? How can you confront this question? And there seemed like a couple or three different possibilities. One was to sort of try to organize legal test cases in order to clarify the law, we would hope, in, in filmmakers' favor. And, and the trouble with that in the United States, at least, is it's very hard to draw copyright owners into that kind of test case litigation. Now, they're, they're happy to send threatening letters, but once, once you actually stand up to them, they almost always back off because the last thing they want to do is to lose and to set a bad precedent. So then we thought, well, what about going to Congress, trying to get some kind of new legislative special dispensation for documentary filmmakers? Um, well, this was in the mid-90s, Republican Congress, Republican in the White House, the idea of, of suggesting the enactment of the Michael Moore Protection Act of 2006 <laughs> didn't seem like it was a political go, and so we began thinking then about other solutions, and we, we settled on the 
possibility of doing some kind of a self-help project within, by, for, and of the documentary community. Now, the reason this was possible is related to the specific doctrinal structure of the fair use doctrine and copyright law in the United States. There are two things that are important to know about fair use in order to understand the project that I'm about to describe. One is that in the last 15 years, give or take, the courts in the United States have dramatically simplified fair use analysis. Most fair use cases, at least of the kind that we're talking about here, that is creative reuse of third party material, come down analytically to one question. The question is, was the use transformative? Did it add value and repurpose the material? And if the answer to that question is yes, then almost invariably the use is found to be fair. That's a good thing to know. The other thing to know is that there is a fascinating historical feedback loop embedded in the fair use doctrine of the United States, something that's been very well, well documented by scholars, including Mike Madison at Pittsburgh, and that feedback loop is simple to understand and important to understand as a foundation of this project. And that is, when courts ask whether a given use was a fair use, they look to the understanding of what constitutes good and reasonable practice within the practice sector involved. So if it's a case about book publishing, courts want to know what book publishers think is good. If it's a case about broadcasting, courts want to know what standards and practices in broadcasting are, and so on and so forth. When practice groups speak clearly about their views on what constitutes good faith reuse of third party material, courts listen. So out of that, standing on those two pillars, emerged the project that eventually resulted in this document the Documentary Filmmaker's Statement of Best Practices in Fair Use of Copyrighted Material, which was released in November 2005. And by the way, a lot of information about this process, about the original research findings, about where the statement came from, and about where it's been since, is collected at the website of the Center for Social Media, www.centerforsocialmedia.org. And it's a good sort of one-stop shopping site for information about this project and about its offshoots. And what we did, simply enough, was to set out to find out what documentary filmmakers, who are, after all, always on both sides of this issue, right? They have copyrights, they like their copyrights, they live by their copyrights, and on the other hand, they depend on reasonable levels of access to third-party copyrighted material in order to tell the truth. What did documentary filmmakers think was a fair and balanced <coughs> approach to the issue of fair use? And we organized these discussions, which took place in the course of nine or ten 20 to 25 person focus groups organized around the United States by various documentary filmmakers organizations. We, we took into and then out of those discussions a set of problem scenarios organized around four different recurrent situations faced by documentary filmmaker. Use of copyrighted third party material for criticism and critique, use of, of, of third party material for purposes of illustration, incidental capture and access to archival material. And as to each of those principle or each of those recurrent situations, the statement contains a a, an assertion of principle as to the application of fair use to that category of use, and then a series of limiting or qualifying principles. What use, you might ask, could such a statement possibly have? Well, obviously someday, if ever, however unlikely that might be, one of these cases, a case involving a filmmaker operating within the four corners of the statement, were to go to court, we think it would be enormously influential. We also don't think that's likely to happen. We suspect that as long as filmmakers operate in and around the zone defined by this statement, they are unlikely ever to face a serious challenge to their practice. So then, if it isn't going to court, where is this statement going? Where has it been? And of course, it's been to filmmakers and filmmakers' organizations, to film schools, to communications departments, to all of the places where the culture of filmmaking is formed, and it's operating in those places as a, an antidote, at least a partial antidote, 
to this toxic <laughs> clearance culture, which we discovered at the beginning of the project had so infected the general field. The other place that the statement has gone influentially is to various gatekeepers who were gatekeepers. Well, what we discovered in this study is that the real problem wasn't with the filmmakers themselves. They weren't <coughs> self-censoring themselves for the, the <coughs> sake of the exercise. They were doing it because somebody, a broadcaster, a distributor, a funder, or an errors and emissions insurance provider had told them they had to. And so it is to those audiences, to the distributors, to the broadcasters, to the funders, and to the errors and emissions providers that this information has gone and where it has been both influ influential. Within a year of the release of the statement, all of the major errors and emissions <coughs> providers in the United States had changed their policy. Within a year of the release of the statement, they were all insuring films that relied on fair use in circumstances where they had previously, in almost every instance, refused to do so. And that has made an enormous transformative difference in the practice in, of, of documentary filmmaking in the United States. Funders, ITVS, to give one example, have likewise embraced the statement. Broadcasters, both commercial and non-commercial, the public broadcasting system, which is a major outlet for documentaries in the United States, as you may know, being a prime example, have likewise embraced the statement, and so on and so forth. So in its, in its field of operation, the statement has had a transformative effect, if I can borrow that terminology, on understandings of fair use in documentary filmmaking, and more important, on actual practice at the gatekeeper level and happily on at the level of, the, of filmmaking practice itself. So this has been, in, in its own terms, very successful. And what it has spawned is a series of related projects, which are really beyond the scope of today's discussion, related projects designed to generate statements or codes of best practices in areas like <coughs> online video production, <coughs> the use of video in the classroom, um, online courseware, which is a project we're working on now, library practice, and so forth. The notion, again, being that in each case, when practice communities join together to articulate vigorously their shared values about fair use, they can affect the situation that surrounds them. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I think that you and your colleagues deserve um, the accolades. Huge, huge congratulations for uh, what you've accomplished so far. It's, for me, the fascinating part is that's actually the beginning of the story and not the end. As you mentioned, there's all of these spin-offs uh, related to fair use best practices in other areas. Uh, not only that, my understanding is that this project has spun off multinationally, and that's what I want to ask you about, Sean. This problem is not just a U.S. problem, it's a global problem, so what's happening in other jurisdictions? And, and I know maybe uh, you could speak to the specifics in areas like um, South Africa, Nigeria, for example, so, so what's happening around the world on this? Well, I think that, that question to some degree is, is what we're trying to figure out at this point. I mean, I think the next stage of this project has been to try to analyze what filmmakers are looking at um, in other countries, how they're dealing with it, and whether any of these same tools can help in other countries. Um, independently of us, and sometimes with us, there have been filmmakers in Canada and in, in the European Union specifically that have begun looking at their own copyright laws and how they can engage either in legislative reform or their own best practices and basically running through those lists of kind of potential strategies that, that Peter got involved with. More recently, we just began um, a project to, to really test the waters in South Africa around these issues. And, and there are a number of reasons that we ended up in South Africa. One of, it, one of them is just personal and relational, that I used to live there and did some clerkships there and have contacts there. And, and, and know a bunch of, just have independently become friends with a lot of filmmakers. And through that just process of friendship and storytelling, found them having some of, but not precisely the same issues. I think a lot of the concerns there have been around, um, it's very difficult, for instance, to make historical documentaries, which is what most filmmakers in South Africa are doing, right? They're comparing the apartheid history to the present. They're telling stories about societal transformations about 
integration, racial integration of the country, about massive political transformations. I mean, these things are the, are the basic working tools of documentaries in South Africa. Almost every documentary deals with these themes, at least, at least on the side. And it's pretty much impossible to make those kind of films without access to footage. You have to have, most of these filmmakers are all kind of post-democracy filmmakers. They don't have their own footage from the apartheid days, which are very hard to, to come across. And most of the footage that was being filmed in those days is being held by essentially two sources. There's the public broadcaster, which in the pre-apartheid days owned all three TV stations. So any kind of South African uh, footage that was actually filmed by a South African would essentially be owned by the public broadcaster. And then the other one was, was BBC, which had a fairly large presence because of the colonial history of South Africa. And that footage would all be held literally outside of the country. So physically located in London, extremely difficult um, to access. So there's this issue of, of getting archival footage that is a constant theme among South Africans. And then you mix that with a misperception about their own, about their own loss. So when do you have to go to the archive? When could you use footage from different sources, whether you borrowed it from a filmmaker, whether you taped it on TV, et cetera? And people are extremely concerned about that in South Africa, but I would say there's, a, there's an extremely low level of understanding about what their, what their current law provides. Um, so it's a fair dealing jurisdiction, much more like you all are studying on a daily basis. Um, we come from a fair use jurisdiction, which is like fair dealing without the first step. So we go straight to the balance and everything's decided on the fairness balance. There are no delineated categories. South Africa's law looks pretty much exactly like Canada's. It has maybe four, might be five. There's delineated categories. The main ones tend to be critique, public uh, news reporting, current events reporting, and then private research, private use research, which are sometimes seen as the same thing, sometimes seen as two independent categories. And nobody really knows what those means in South Africa. Um, there's very little litigation, there's been very little copyright litigation, very little case law has come out. Um, very few filmmakers even could cite them. We have, we, so we just did a survey of 50 or so filmmakers, and I would say the most dominant response is there are no exceptions except for incidental use. Everything else has to be licensed. So that on one side, that's the perception of the law. And then you get this interesting conflict with the practice, which is basically nobody really licenses anything unless they're going to international distribution. And so you have this kind of, we think we're constantly breaking the law all the time, but we have to in order to get our films out. And that's kind of the current state. And then I would say the next piece of the project is going to be to run through those strategies. So what do you want to do? Is, there, is it easier to do test case litigation there? Is that a viable option? There actually is legislative reform being planned on the South African copyright, in part because it's a law from 1975. It doesn't envision the digital environment. Technically, every time you're sending an email, you're violating copyright law in South Africa. So there's, there's a need to reform it, and the question is, will that open up space to actually change the fair dealing legislative language to make it more amenable to documentary filmmaking? Or is, is best practices type, type statements, is that useful? Is there enough space within the law, especially since it hasn't been uh, demonstrably interpreted by the courts, can we expand the idea of critique to include a much broader range of things that documentary filmmakers do every day? Can we take that word review and make that a much broader concept that would include things that we do on a daily basis? Um, news and current events, a point that Tina brought up at dinner last night. Isn't every documentary essentially a news and current event description? I mean, they're basically telling stories about what's happening now in its relation to the past. Should all of that kind of be lumped underneath an exception? Or, this is a live debate in South Africa, should we just shift? Should we get rid of fair dealing, just shift to fair use? Should everything go on a balancing test? Would that be better or worse? And these are things of which we don't have opinions yet. They're not for us to even decide. Um, and people haven't decided there. This project is about nine months old, and, and, and that's basically where we are. The debate is just very much beginning there. 
Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, we here at the University of Ottawa are very fortunate to be one of the uh, project's uh, international partners working around these issues. I know CIPIC has been extremely active. Um, it's also interesting to hear you talk about the law reform opportunities in South Africa because in Canada we're uh, undergoing a long process of uh, law reform. Um, because the process is unfolding in the way that it is, I know one of the things that CIPIC has been interested in is what to do in the interim. How can we fill the gaps without law reform? What can be done in terms of um, addressing this issue? So, so David, can you speak to what CIPIC has been doing in that regard? Yeah, sure. Um, we've been working with the Documentary Organization of Canada uh, for a while now, but the truth is my interest in documentary films and copyright uh, goes back geez, over a decade now. Um, in Canada, I mean, we don't have fair use, we have fair dealing. And you know, we just heard a description of some of the differences between those, uh, those two concepts. Uh, back in the, in, the, in the 90s, I would say that the differences were, were, were even greater. Fair dealing was at that time very restrictively interpreted. We had these five categories, and if you didn't fall under those categories strictly construed, you were not, uh, you were not legal. Uh, no matter how fair the deal, uh, and that struck me as a real problem for documentary filmmakers, uh, particularly given that the heart and soul of what documentary filmmakers do so often is really it's kind of transformative, right? There, there's critical elements, but you wouldn't say this is you know criticism in the sense of literary criticism. Uh, and uh, you know it's a movie, but it's not a movie review, even though a lot of what they're doing is reviewing what has happened and, and, and uh, uh, you know kind of the, the history of whatever the subject is uh, in the film. Uh, so it struck me, you know, early on in my copyright studies, that documentary filmmakers, uh, they were in tough uh, in copyright in Canada. And, and in fact, I would have argued uh, a decade ago that we had a, a documentary film tradition in Canada, despite uh, what copyright law has to say about it. Uh, and then we had uh, the CCH and Law Society decision uh, in the early part of this de decade. And uh, that decision really kind of opened the door, in my view, to documentary filmmakers uh, getting much more active uh, kind of in an, on an interpretational front, uh, making use of fair dealing in a way that I think the door was closed to uh, prior to that decision. And I mean, I'd say that decision did two things that really helps documentary filmmakers. One, uh, it said, we're not going to strictly construe these categories, we're going to purposively construe these categories. And that means that, uh, in my view anyways, and I think the view of a lot of my colleagues, um, if you're going to interpret fair dealing, now you have to take into account kind of the penumbra of meaning around these five categories, whereas in the past you might just have considered the core meaning of, of these five categories. And that really uh, gave a lot of flexibility to the copyright, uh, uh, to copyright interpretation in, uh, in the art of documentary filmmaking. The second thing that the CCH decision did uh, was it, uh, it tapped into this feedback loop uh, that, uh, that Peter described, where uh, the, uh, the court the Supreme Court looked at what the Law Society itself had to say about fair practices, research practices in particular. Uh, and I, I took that as a marching orders. That said that the court is going to look at the community that's examining for what is fair, for some content of what's, what's within fair dealing. And if you're a documentary filmmaker, that actually puts you in a pretty good position because as a creator, uh, you can say, am I comfortable with this dealing were it to happen to my own work? Uh, and if so, then that gives you a I think a pretty good sense of what an accepted practice would be in the documentary space. Uh, and that's where the Documentary Organization of Canada came in. Um, uh, I knew Brett uh, through some, uh, some non-copyright, non-documentary work that we did for, uh, uh, for Mr. Gaylor's project, uh, Homeless Nation, uh, uh, which is an interesting project if you get a chance, take a look at homelessnation.org. Um, and uh, through the work uh, that I did with Brett there, um, we started talking about copyright and documentary films. Uh, and uh, Brett, I'm not sure if at that time he was on the document or pardon me, the, the copyright committee of DOC, uh, but he was shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, we started thinking about ways that, uh, that uh, CIPIC could help DOC on copyright. And uh, that led pretty quickly uh, to, the, uh, to the discussion of kind of porting uh, the best practices model that, that Peter uh, and his group had prepared into Canada. And uh, that was a, that's an ongoing, uh, ongoing process. It's an ongoing document, but we've had, a, we've had a relatively final draft in place for about a year now. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we hope to have that thing kind of finalized and, uh, and out. Uh, 
certainly uh, this year anyway. Were it to happen to uh, the discussion of Brett and the film that we started this panel presentation uh, with. And I know that um, one of the issues for Brett in making that film was what he can and cannot do in terms of using uh, other copyright protected work to tell his perspective on this issue of the copyright culture. Um, and I understand CIPIC's been active in that regard as well. Yeah, so we acted uh, kind of as uh, uh, Brett's first uh, clearance council, uh, so to speak, in terms of uh, you know, taking a look at this film and deciding what did we have to clear and uh, what could he rely on fair dealing for and not have to clear. And uh, you know, I've done I've done work in this space in the past, in you know, kind of my, uh, my previous you know uh, uh, practice experience. But I got to tell you, it was quite a <laughs> you know talk about mind blowing. The kind of sitting down and going through that opening five minute sequence that you just saw, all the clips in there. All the music, all the all the, the references to kind of the, uh, our shared culture in the space, and I thought, oh my God, this is going to be a hopeless task. Um, and, and that's five minutes of, I think, an eighty-minute film. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, and it doesn't stop. I mean, that's just it. Just keeps going. Uh, it's a it's a film that really takes. Uh, it's a documentary film. That's that's the best way to put it. <coughs> David, uh, can you give me an example of something that could stay as a fair dealing in Canada, and something that had to go because? You thought it went over the line. Yeah, well, you know, there were. It's interesting. There, there are two reasons why something uh, had to either had to go or had to get cleared. Um, and one reason why uh, it had to go or get cleared was because it went beyond the pale uh, of what fair dealing would, could count as, in my view. Uh, and an example, a few examples of that were, were clips that Brett was using to make his point, and they were on point. Uh, and then I would argue that perhaps uh, the, the, the duration or how long the clip played may have gone on a bit, uh, a bit too long. And not, you know, not too long from an editorial perspective. I think what he was probably doing was more stylistic than anything else, right? And when you start to stray beyond uh, what's strictly necessary for commentary or criticism or, or you know, to make your point into kind of the more artistic uh, elements of the film, uh, then you're, I think, outside of fair dealing and, and we need to get something cleared. The other reason why, uh, why things would get cleared, why well, I guess really there are two additional reasons. One, uh, uh, I guess the litigiousness of the, uh, of the party was a, feature, was a factor. So there was a clip, um, and I'm not sure if it's going to make it to the final cut, but there was a clip from, uh, uh, that some of you may have seen, it was a mashup of, uh, of um, uh, John Lennon's Imagine with uh, George Bush's, you know, various clips from George Bush's speeches, where George Bush is, uh, is basically uh, uh, speaking the words to imagine. And I think the view on that, no matter how well it fit into the film, uh, was that uh, the Oklahoma state was going to have something to say about it. And if, you know, even if it was legal, even if it was fair under our you know, Canadian copyright law, uh, the transaction costs in establishing that were going to be too high. And so it just made sense to cut through the process and get that license. And I'm not sure whether they did or they decided to, to keep it out uh, of the final cut. And, uh, I, I understand they're still working on the final cut. It should be out within a month's time. Uh, you know, but that's a good. Example. And then a, a final example of, of why things got pulled out of the film uh, was uh, permissions just weren't granted. Than ten thousand dollars, <laughs> and you also need the money to make the film. So if you kind of add up how many clips were just in the first five minutes of Brett's uh, film, you know, multiply that times five to ten thousand dollars if you had to clear everything, um, you quickly run out of money for the film. And that's one problem we're really having in the clearance industry is that the rights holders, it used to be a whole bunch of little archives that you can negotiate with and say, you know, I'm making a documentary film. It, Costs like $150,000 as the total budget. Wondering if you could give me a deal on, you know, getting you know X seconds of this work, and uh, and you could strike a deal. And often they sometimes waive the fee or give you a very reduced fee. But now all those little archives have disappeared, and they're now being gobbled up by the Sony's and the um, big Universals. And suddenly you're dealing with one copyright holder that didn't care if you're making. Couldn't care if your budget is a fraction of what a feature dramatic film would be. And so you're stuck where a bigger proportion of your budget is being spent on clearances 
and that money's not going into the actual production of the film. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why Doc has uh, done a number of things. The first thing we did was a, a little survey of our members about six years ago, <coughs> Howard, I think. And then um, out of that came the fact that very few of our filmmakers had actually ever had a claim on their errors and emissions insurance. So why are you paying 10 grand for errors and emissions insurance when there's no claims by documentary filmmakers based on that? Um, then came to our aid and wrote a wonderful white paper on, on uh, copyright for us and, and fair dealing that uh, we then presented to the government. Because there has, the reason why there's no claims is because um, often it's settled out of court or it's settled with a, a, a letter saying cease and desist and that's as far as it goes. So there was kind of this open door without any jurisprudence to fall back on. And so what the white paper has done um, is kind of form a little bit of a framework that we're hoping to build upon with the best practices that uh, David is working on. And the government has welcomed that because they would prefer to have a bit of a frame rather than this wide open door. Um, and they don't want to go to the problem of actually legislate, putting anything into legislation. So in doing that, we've then gone the next step, which is go to the E&O insurers and say, listen, We've got this framework. We've got surveys, and we did a recent, more recent survey two years ago that again showed that out of 100, over 150 films that had er errors and emissions insurance policies, only three of them ever made a claim on them. You know, and we took it to an insurer, and the insurer said, "Oh, you, yeah, it does look like documentaries are very low risk." And now, for those $150,000 productions or quarter of a million productions. We actually can get an E&O policy that's only like three to four thousand dollars. I mean, like you know, five to six thousand dollars to actually put into rights clearance. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really where the problem exists because we're not sure where this culture of clearance is coming from because the lawyers, for the, broad, the broadcasters say, "Oh, we didn't ask for that," and the insurers are saying, "Oh, we didn't ask for you to clear that," and our our lawyers said, oh, we didn't ask. So no one's kind of taking any responsibility for the need to clear things that actually are quite obviously fall either under incidental use or, or, or dealing. So what we've been trying to do through this process is educate the lawyers who are looking at our work and clearing it for us. We've been trying to create, again, the legal framework that, that you know, the, the ministry, <coughs> Minister of Culture can take a look at, Heritage and Culture can take a look at. Okay, this is this is what fair dealing is, and I mean the, the tangible benefit has been decreasing the costs for you know for our, our, our members, and what we're trying to negotiate right now is a, is an amendment onto the you know policy that would allow for fair dealing defense that they would cover you if you were actually taken to court because you had something that fell fair dealing according to your legal counsel. And that's what David and I have been going back and forth and hoping to create for Brett's film. So, you know, so that's kind of where we're going is we're trying to create a framework. We've been very inspired by what's happening in American University and the best practices document has come out of that inspiration. And we're looking at somehow creating a stronger framework so that there's less ambiguity about what you have to do as a filmmaker to clear things. In terms of concrete examples of how it's affecting filmmakers, um, there are films at the National Film Board of Canada, for example, where the rights have expired. And rather than renew the rights because it would be too costly, because those rights are now owned by the big you know, rights holders, they're choosing to take the films out of circulation. And that's where, when you talk about documentary films creating a document of our history, we're losing important films that should be part of our history, um, you know, and uh, and so you have things that are disappearing from being available to future generations because they can't, because the film board won't, you know, buy the rights. Can't take the risk. Can't take the risk. Um, a personal example for me has been, I created a, a film about a kindergarten, and every day the kindergarten would end with uh, everybody singing the goodbye song from the bear in the big blue house, which was Jim Henson production. Um, the rights for that song belong, belong to Sony, um, and I negotiated the rights for a five-year duration. 
And then when the film's done, I said, oh, well, I've got some money here. Can I negotiate for the rights in perpetuity so that, you know, we don't have to keep negotiating? And so that became a three-year kind of email exchange that ended when Sony got back to me and said, I just sold those rights to Disney. So we'd like you to start talking to Disney now, um, which means basically it's, I don't got the rights to that. I look at cutting that section out of my film when the five years expires. And that's kind of, you know, for all the rules you could create, it ultimately comes down to the access that the rights holders will give you. Whether they do it in a timely fashion, like I was waiting three years to hear back and sold to someone else. Whether it's affordable, when you think it's a little film that's made under, under $150,000 about a kindergarten for disabled kids in Toronto, like, really, like, what is the right of that worth if I've already paid them five grand? Or the renewal of that shouldn't be another five grand, right? But I'm dealing with Disney now, so who knows what it could be, you know? So there's a number of issues that affect our members, and that clarity of creating a framework around the open door is what we're hoping great, great. Can, 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 can make, and that's why we're so grateful for David and Howard's work. And, yeah. Yeah. I, and we're fortunate to have an embarrassment of riches here. Um, actually, I'd, I'd like, we have a, a portable microphone there. I, I'd like to actually ask Howard, if you don't mind, to put you on the spot here, to elaborate a little bit on that excellent document that you prepared. Um, Howard was commissioned by the documentary organization to, um, to write uh, a white paper uh, dealing with Fair dealing in documentary <coughs> films. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? What your findings were? Uh, sure, sure, Jeremy. I actually did not uh, prepare anything uh, for today. I did bring a copy of the paper, which is um, available on my firm's website, uh, Ms. Sarah Jarzina. If you click through, okay. it's also available on the doc docorg.ca, the Documentary Organization of Canada. Oh, I'm pretty I, sure. I, our white papers, the white papers on our website. Okay. And the we'll letter link. to the minister. And we'll add a link to that to the okay. let's talk. I don't know where it gets in, but find it. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Um, I, I did this paper a couple of years ago, six I guess, um, and um, uh, it it, uh, it was a very interesting exercise, and I uh, I'm, I'm both happy and, and rather depressed at what I'm hearing today. A, a mixture of both. I'm happy that it's, that Peter's effort is working in the United States. <coughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm depressed that, that we aren't getting apparently too far in Canada. And, and uh, I have made about a dozen recommendations in my paper. I can briefly mention some of them. But, but um, What's the most important? Well, the one I, the, my favorite one, I won't say it's the most important, but <laughs> the favorite one, because it just rankles me, is that we should have an explicit satire and parody exception put into the Copyright Act, um, uh, along, uh, and along with the words such as. So you want so legislative reform is, is yeah, the biggest I, recommendation. I, I firmly believe, Jeremy, that we need legislative reform in Canada. Not that a best practices of approach would would, uh, would would not help. I think it would. But I think we need belt and suspenders, as as one of the presidents of Peter's great country once said. We need to walk softly but carry a big stick. We can't rely on best practices in Canada. We have a couple of really uh, unfortunate court decisions from the late 90s, uh, the Michelin case, the Hager case, that are getting severely in the way of documentarians. Uh, some professors seem to think that these, you know, these, the Michelin case is wrongly decided, especially in light of CCH. But the fact that, that one or two professors, or maybe even 10 or 20 professors, think it was wrongly decided is not going to impress some judge out in BC, as we have just seen. So you can't, you know, we need a change in the law. If we wait for the Supreme Court to get this right, we could be waiting another 10 or 20 years and it may never happen. Let me follow up with you on that point, actually, because I think it's an important one. Um, traditionally, the, uh, the stereotypical view of the differences between fair use in the U.S. and fair dealing in Canada is that fair use in the United States is more flexible because it doesn't have the enumerated categories. You just cut to the chase and ask whether the use was fair based on a variety of factors. In Canada, you've got to fit yourself within a number of categories, but now, thanks to the Supreme Court in Canada, uh, defined in a large and liberal manner. But in other ways, Canadian law is more flexible than U.S. law. For example, our Supreme Court has held that one can be a fair dealing facilitator. You could facilitate somebody else's fair dealing if you're a library or perhaps a, uh, a rights clearance um, company or, or something like that. And that doesn't exist. That flexibility doesn't exist in the U.K. or or the U.S. So, are you sure legislation is, is the problem? 
Jer Jeremy, if, if you and I were on the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, or, you know, <laughs> that might be fine, but the trouble is for a um, You tell that to some, um, some young lawyer who's just gotten herself himself a job on Bay Street and says, oh, I get clear documentary film now. How many Coca-Cola logos and McDonald's logos and, and, and whatever uh, Sony uh, clips can I find uh, to run up the bill so I can charge a lot to say no to these people? That's the mentality out there. Even amongst people that you would think would have a fair, uh, a, a, a broad view of fair dealing, our educators, our librarians in Canada either haven't read the CCH case, or if they've read it, they haven't understood it, or if their lawyers have read it, their lawyers haven't understood it, because they're afraid of their own shadow. So the case, you know, they're afraid to do anything, they're afraid to go to court, even though they would probably win, but not with the legal advice they're getting right now. So we're at stalemate. I mean, we, we are seeing all that we, we saw in the recent Copyright Act uh, 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 amendments, proposal from the educators that was, uh, that was shocking in terms of its lack of thought uh, uh, for, for, for something they don't need that would mess up everything for everybody else. Many of us know what I'm talking about here. So, yes, the Supreme Court has spoken, but no, nobody understands what they've said. Okay, let me ask the panelists this question. Uh, obviously, resources are limited. People don't have an infinite <laughs> amount of time. Documentary filmmakers are worried about making documentary films. Um, how do you prioritize scarce resources? Do you lobby for legislative reforms? Do you uh, pursue test cases, or do you work on best practices? What, what, does the, what do the panelists think about how to prioritize limited resources? Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. Uh, okay, so I'm about to say uh, you do two things. <laughs> <laughs> I think best I think best practices initiatives are always good. Uh, so you know, I think the, the clarity that a community can bring to bear to an issue through an exercise in building best practices from within can carry forward, even in the event of, uh, you know, of a legislative change. Uh, so I still think that a best practices initiative is a good thing, even if we do get uh, uh, you know, changes to fair dealing that liberalize it and deal with many of the issues um, that, that documentary filmmakers have. And that having been said, I, I think that uh, legislative reform of fair dealing is necessary and should always be pursued. I mean, copyright reform is a permanent feature Policy, the policy scene in Ottawa now, and uh, it's a mistake to let fair dealing slide off it. Okay. Peter, what do you think? Well, I, I made earlier the, the claim for best practices in the context of U.S. law, and, and I, I, I really think that that was strategically, and in terms of, of cost efficiency, the right place to start if it should lead to test cases. <coughs> circumstances, the remix culture, as well as new technological ones, and there's a tremendous danger that were it to be opened up and, and repacked with what happened to be the specific demands of particular constituencies on given days, especially since that opening would also permit the politically very powerful large institutional copyright holders in the United States to have their say about fair use and they would have their way, it would go away entirely. Uh, I don't think legislative reform is a, is a, is a good path in the, US. in the U.S. But that isn't to say that it isn't the path for South Africa, or even that it isn't the path for Canada. Much depends, in, in any case, on how the copyright reform process works yeah. and how confident one uh, any user group feels that they are going to get a fair hearing in that process as against the forces that will, if they if they can, uh, shut down the existing limitations and exceptions um, in as part of the the, the, the legal rewrite. Yeah. That, Any sense about what the you know South Africans, the Israelis, the Nigerians are they 
Is it a legal problem or a practical problem in other jurisdictions? Yes, it is. Both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my sense, so first of all, I, I come at this issue as, A, a person who does not have an extremely deep copyright background. I actually come in into intellectual property from more of an access to medicines perspective, so I've been doing this for maybe a year and a half. Um, and then second, as an American, so my first, my first uh, kind of exposure to flexibilities is through a fair use doctrine. And so when I read fair dealing, it looks to me like what you were saying first. Why, why would you want, as, a, as someone who's, who's advocating for user interest, two tests when you could have one? So why do you want kind of a categorical list and then only then get to fair, fairness? I think, I think there are some reasons to have at least, so, so Peter made the, the distinction between illustrative and exclusive. So I've never seen an illustrative fair dealing statute. Every statute we've reviewed, including Nigeria and Australia and South Africa and everything else, it's not illustrative. And it's not illustrative in, in how it's been interpreted. It's exclusive. The first test is you got to be one of these four or five things. And if you're not one of those four or five things, you never get to fairness. So it, none of the statutes I review being transformative is never one of the four or five things. So you've got to be something else. So that kind of core fair use test of whether you've transformed some work for whatever purpose from one thing into another, and that itself pretty much gets you by, that doesn't exist in any fair dealing statute. Mm -hmm. So now there's two kind of... Now, it was interesting because I almost heard David, I think, when you were describing kind of the advice you were giving on this film, adopt that as your standard. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, so you said, and I wrote down, if well, if he was making commentary or if he was using the film to make a point, then you would be more inclined to kind of put it in your fair dealing category. It's not painfully obvious to me which fair dealing category it goes in. So you would have to really kind of expand the notion of critique or expand the notion of review to be extremely wide in order to kind of include those things in. Or if you achieve the statutory change, you know, such as including whatever, then you have a lot more kind of fluidity within the concept. And I could see the argument that having some examples might help, and we talked about this last night, of kind of giving a judge a trigger for if it, if it is one of those categories, you should give a strong presumption that it passes the fairness test. But if they're exclusive, not illustrative, then it seems to disadvantage users because then you're going to have ultimately litigation over whether your kind of broad construction of that word is really what was intended in the statute. If they meant transformative, why didn't they say transformative? Why did they say critique? You know, which doesn't sound the same. Yeah. So. I, I'm ashamed I haven't done this sooner, but uh, the idea was to take questions from the audience. We actually have two microphones on the left and the right side of the room. Um, so, Howard, we'll give you the first question. Okay, I've got the microphone. That's so, convenient. I'll, 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 just, just a quick follow-up. Not yeah. much questions, comments, but but we we um um I I am convinced that we need some some legislation. Uh, I mean, uh, the Supreme Court's got it right. A, a lot of lawyers understand it. Teen has obviously made some great progress, but still, it, it, it's 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 not enough. Uh, and now is the perfect opportunity because copyright is very much on the mind of Parliament. Whether that whether a bill comes before or after the next election, whether you have to wait for the majority government. Who knows? But at least it's it's on the horizon. There's an open window right now. What we need to do is persuade corporate interests, the, 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 the major creator interests in Canada uh, that are over at the CRTC right now, asking for lots of money. We need to persuade the broadcasters. We need to persuade the insurers that this is not only the right thing to do, but it's a profitable thing to do. That that if Michael Moore can make money around the world from document documentary movies, so can Canadians. Canadians make really good movies. The NFD has been around for decades. We're terrific at this, but we need to get these chains off our, you know, handcuffs off our, 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 our documentary making. We need to be bold. We need to take chances. There are, you know, countless examples we've all, David C. and I see, where we can go to court absolutely sure that we're likely, sure that we're going to win. But, you know, we have to go there. We have to be prepared to take that step or take, make that block call and do it. That's the practitioner in me. Um, the, 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 you know, the academic in me says, oh, you know, you don't, you don't have to, but we can't wait 
forever. It's not going to solve itself. Okay. But Questions? you need legislation. So I think you also have to point out that Michael Moore, um, some of his recent documentaries have actually been made as Canadian films. <laughs> <laughs> They've been made through uh, Soldier Street in Halifax. Thank you very much for the panel. <laughs> Uh, I'm probably asking a complex question, but if I'm here, I might as well ask one. As I understand, if I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm in, say, a diner filming a, an interview with somebody, in the background, people are moving about, then there's a reasonable expectation that they just walked into frame and that there's no responsibility to them for clearance. However, if I understand what you're saying, Howard, if a Coke can happens to be on the table while we're conducting the interview, there's a potential that we need clearance from Coke. So why, it, and I have two pieces to this, why is it that, that that Coke can would not fall under the same category as people passing in and out? And to flip it the other way, why isn't it that Coke would have to pay me because the Coke can happens to be on there? Okay, so I'm gonna ask David and Peter to respond to that without any legal ease. Hmm, sure. But also the third example, which is you're sitting in a restaurant and they happen to be playing a top 40 song in the background. Sure. Oh, Which stay is... away from the music issue. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's so, a whole so just thing. you're talking that's, a trademark that's issue here. But if, if you want to throw the music in, that's great. Yeah, okay, so avoiding legalese, uh, those kind of situations arguably raise issues under copyright and trademark. The short answer is there is no trademark issue. Trademark law does not require clearance there because there's no trademark use. Uh, which is, you know, that's your key to entry into uh, liability under the Trademark Act. So the idea that you need to blur out the Coke logo is just a myth? It's a myth under trademark law, and under copyright law, we've got uh, an accidental or incidental and not deliberate inclusion exception. A little bit of legalese there, but that's the words of the statute. It is all law school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, no, so, there's no, uh, you know, so there's no reason under copyright law or trademark law to blur out that Coke can. Uh, uh, again, practicalities sometimes arise. Do you think that Coke is going to make problems for you that will be expensive to deal with? Uh, and as a preemptive strike, do you want to clear that? I mean, that's a, just a practical question. Uh, you know, we the do Yoko have Ono a, question. A solid example, though, of copyright um, infringement where there was a cease and desist letter at the CBC. There was a, a film made about um, young drug users. And there was somebody satisfying his his need and urging to eat after a certain drug use that uh, that he went to a Burger King and he was sitting there eating a Whopper, and then he got sick from the drug use and he got a, there was a cease and desist letter from Burger King because they were like people might might decide that because there was a Burger King wrapper on what made him sick that that's what made him sick. So is, is that just uh, an idle threat? It, well, they they pulled the piece. They pulled that, that uh, Did section. they have to, Peter? So, three things. Um, <laughs> every, everything David said is right under U.S. law as well as Canadian law, and although the, 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 the details of why it's right on the copyright side are slightly different, the, the conclusions are exactly the same. The second point I'll make about United States law is that it would apply equally to the top 40 music in the background. Yeah. And the third point is that cease and desist letters are cheap. Cease and desist letters are not lawsuits. Cease and desist letters are pieces of paper that cost the time of a junior lawyer to pull some quotes from the file and put them on the letterhead. And they are absolutely the, they're the bane of exist, the existence of practitioners in every field, librarianship, teaching, uh, documentary filmmaking and people have got to to get to the point of having the courage where they know that they're in the right as that filmmaker was with respect to Burger King because there's no legal claim. But that's going to be a scary proposition for a filmmaker Why? to see a letter like this. But this is the decision from CBC that, that they would cut that question. It's the gatekeeper. It's the gatekeeper. And gatekeepers and should know very better. Afraid. In fact, gatekeepers should know a lot better. Okay. And that's where, once again, information comes in, whether it's in the form of best practices or whether it's in the form of material that lawyers and others can provide to clarify some of the urban folklore of intellectual property. Information is enormously important. I was saying this morning that, that on the Center for Social Media website, if you go there, along with other documents, there's a document we prepared ver very early in this process, way back in, in 2005, in fact, or early 2006, called called 
called Yes, You Can. We had it first. <laughs> we allow him to use it. Uh, and it's just a list of all of the stupid things that people tell you you can't do, which you have every legal right to do, including shooting the Coke can and the Burger King rack. Okay. I was just going to make the point that the difference between the Coke situation and the Burger King situation is Burger King might perceive that it has some reputational value uh, that makes it worthwhile for them to invest in something that goes beyond a cease and desist letter. It might be even worthwhile to start a lawsuit because the cost of doing so is worth it to them because they perceive there's reputational value to protect. Coke says, free advertising, go for it. <laughs> All right. Got a question. Uh, going back to a documentary uh, type, uh, and, and probably a, a social justice documentary type, uh, I think we have a class here, uh, uh, Professor St. Louis office. So you're making a documentary and you're being critical of, let's say, a resource extraction company. And so you pan on their corporate logo that may be painted on a water tower or whatever uh, for five or six seconds deliberately. Uh, and then you may go back and you may film their head, their head office building. And there, again, the name of the company might be there along with the, the logo. And then so you, you film that. Uh, and then you want to post it not to, or not to distribute it through NFB or any other... Post it on YouTube. Uh, yes, exactly. So what kind of uh, situation, to someone who has no background in law or, or, or copyright, what, what are they looking at facing, potentially? Well, is that the difference between me interviewing David in front of that logo and it just happens to incidentally be behind David, as opposed to specifically filming a pan of that logo? Is there a difference, gentlemen, in that use? I think they're both uh, clear, that's why. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that's the case, but the reasons from a copyright law perspective are slightly different, because now we're moving outside of the incidental inclusion exception, which is a particular exception built into our Copyright Act, and we're starting to move into uh, fair dealing, right? So there's a critical element to what you're doing, that's, that's why you linger, uh, you know, that's why you linger on the, on the logo, you're identifying the subject of your criticism, and that's why you're under fair dealing. So you might be better off. Or it's just a different mechanism? Well, the beauty of the incidental inclusion is it's so clean, right? Okay. It's just incidental and not deliberate. Uh, fair dealing, all of a sudden, now you've got some arguments that, no, no, I'm under one of the five purposes. Uh, you know, it's fair, and, and we've got problems as well. We haven't talked about this, but one other difference in, between Canada and the United States is if you're, you're, if you're fair dealing for one of the, kind of the public purposes, right? Criticism, uh, news, news summary, or, or, or what have you. Uh, you've got to mention the author, uh, pardon me, you've got to mention the source and the author if given the source, mm -hmm. which is a difficult thing to do for a logo, right? Uh, is it, you know, so this is one of the reasons why I think that we can't give up on fair dealing. I think this is another element of fair dealing that needs to be taken up in a legislative review. I, th I think those are valid considerations, but that, that goes to fairness, right? Michael Donaldson, who was at our school a couple weeks ago and is a, a copyright lawyer, has worked with us in some of these projects has a rule of thumb that, that at least, you know, should work under U.S. law, which is if you can say it, you can show it. And certainly no one would dispute with you that you could write an essay that this specific company and name the company is the object of my critique. And therefore you can also show that. Interesting. And I, I, don't, I think it's actually an easy case. Yeah. And if it's after all their choice to have been known in the world by that logo. Hmm. Right. I came from the area of uh, microchip design, and I'm just wondering, in that particular area, there's a lot of sharing of IP, and the companies have all developed their own mutual um, brand scheme, reasonable and non-discriminatory licensing schemes. And I'm just wondering, has there been any discussion between the documentary community and the big media companies about forming that kind of a scheme where they can come up with a sort of a win-win situation for them? Or not, and I'm just wondering, is that possible? Maybe with the backing of possible policy legislation that might say mandatory licensing. Mm -hmm. That'd be lovely, but I think they they really see us as being a non-commercial venture for them. So, you know, and then we have to consider things like the CBC archives was recently sold to the BBC, which is kind of <laughs> done under the table. So, you know, I, I, it, they're just seeing it as property, and I think it's it's very unlikely that, that it'd be great if it could happen that way, but I doubt that it would, they wouldn't. There's another, there's another risk as well, which I think doesn't necessarily 
exist in the, in the, in the microchip design field. The one area of creative practice in which I'm aware, in which there are such cross-licensing arrangements, is music sampling. One of the reasons that we have so little law about fair use in music sampling is that most of the major labels in the United States have cross-licensing cross deals with one another, and so they are able, or more accurately, the artists who are under contract to them are able to sample more or less at will. The trouble with those arrangements is that they don't apply to people who want to sign with major labels. So that individual artists, people who are producing for the web, people who haven't yet got a record contract, and who are doing sampling practice, are completely frozen out of those arrangements. So, like Girl Talk. The, like Girl Talk, who has decided instead to rely on fair use, and so far has been very successful in doing so. Uh, so I don't know what the solution is, how, how you would have a viable cross-licensing scheme which didn't exclude the, the the rising talents, whoever they might be in the field. And that would be my concern. Well, one model is you could actually do it among the rising talents. So in, in, the, in our South African surveys, there were two ideas that came out. One is that a lot of the um, filmmakers themselves said that, A, one of our primary sources of material is informally contacting other filmmakers and using things that are in their own digital libraries and just working out informal relationships usually for free in order to use that material. And, to, and the, the second piece is that there's actually an organization that is formed in South Africa called the South Africa History Archives that's attempting to get as much historical footage as it can, not just film footage, but actually historical materials and things, and creating a new public archive that would be free and publicly open and accessible. And then one of, and several, two or three of the more sophisticated um, uh, survey respondents in the film world said, you know, actually said, you know, why don't we as filmmakers create some kind of a copyright pool or something with our footage and have it more easily accessible? So I don't have to know Joe filmmaker. It would actually be in a place where all documentarians would have agreed to kind of share footage and it can be easily searchable or something. I think that's an idea that will probably resurface in, a, in, our, um, in our further conversations. Yeah. That triggers, a, um, the, the, uh, we're running out of time here and I feel like I failed as a moderator for not bringing this up sooner, but the <laughs> issue that that raises for me is uh, one of technological very protection tech measures. <laughs> Technologi <laughs> yeah, technological <laughs> protection measures. That, that's the question I want to close on actually. Are technological protection measures, digital locks and prohibitions on circumventing them, a problem for documentary filmmakers? I think the, um, the problem that existed in Bill C-61 that um, would have made it illegal to break a digital lock for the purposes of research would, have been, would be devastating to the documentary film industry. Um, because you, if you, for example, I have a, a friend who did a film about the history of polygraphs, so you're dealing with films like Four Weddings and a Funeral and a whole bunch of other films, but you don't know which, which films you're going to use out of the vast library of polygram. So, you know, you take the DVDs of the films you're thinking of using, you digitize them into your system, which involves breaking a digital lock, and then you figure out what you want, you make your shortlist, and then you send that to polygram, and then they send you, you know, a time, a, a time stamped version, a time uh, code stamped version so that you can make your final selects and negotiate for the rights. So you're, you're breaking a digital lock for a legitimate purpose that will result in the rights holder actually being paid mm -hmm. for the use of that copyrighted material. Under Bill C-61, every time you broke that digital lock, you could be charged $10,000 as a corporation, which would quickly bankrupt any documentary film company. Okay, let me, let me, ask, you, let me, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, the NFB recently opened its vault and made available hundreds of films online. They did that without any prohibitions on circumvention, yeah. uh, protection for digital locks in Canada. Are you aware of anybody in the filmmaking community who believes that that sort of provision is necessary or desirable, a, a prohibition on circumventing digital locks in order to facilitate new business models or anything? Or well, do you see it as a problem? That new business model is very important because the reason why there's cost to acquiring any copyrighted material is because the old school version of accessing the material was somebody had to physically go into the vault, find the film, and then actually put it onto a VHS or something that you could view. And that cost you money. And you had to pay by the minute for that to happen, right? 
by doing what the end of bees done, it's bypass the actual physical man or woman hours to get the footage to you, mm -hmm. which is why they can offer it for free because you still have to pay for the rights mm -hmm. if you order that footage I see. online. I bet you, right? But it allows you to preview it for free, and it bypasses them having to having to have someone in their archives pulling the footage for you. Yeah. Did you want the last word on that? Peter? Well, just to say that the, the, that is a wonderful new business model. That's one that could be accomplished through the use of 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 low res material rather than digital locks. The last word is. Don't go there. Uh, it's a nightmare, and it's a 10-year nightmare, and we have yet to fully awake from it in the United States, even though the rats are leaving the ship in, in every direction now, and it's only a matter of time before it goes down. Uh, the the uncertain provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of, 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 of 1998 are the, 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 the worst conceived and, and least productive uh, example of recent copyright legislation in the United States, and that's saying something. Uh, so it, please, 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 keep up the good fight. I mean, we, we may be successful this year in carving out a limited exception to the DMCA circumvention, any circumvention provisions for documentary filmmakers. But that's if it's successful, and we will we will not know until next year. That will be the result of a ten-year campaign, hundreds and thousands of man hours and, and woman hours invested in something that should never have been necessary in the first place. Okay. Well, with that last word, please join me in apologizing to the professor who has this room next and thanking the panelists <laughs> in uh, uh, coming to join us today. Thank you very much. By the way, I understand that there are some copies of this document that are going to make it in a FedEx, maybe later today or tomorrow, and they'll be available where? We're going to make copies of the U.S. Best Practices Guidelines links from this website, let's.copyright.ca, and uh, through our tech law manager uh, here. Okay. And the uh, film screening of Brett Gaylor's film is when? Yes. Uh, for anybody interested in watching the movie, you see the clip at the beginning, Rip for Remix Manifesto. It's great. It's really, really good. The Student Federation, uh, with the Canadian Student Federation, the NFB will be showing it on the 25th of March. So you still have a month time to plan ahead. We're going to be screening it.